Sunday School Leader. I've had a pretty good week so far. How about you? In last week's prep talk, I mentioned that my grandsons were coming to see me, and they did. We had a great time. They left a couple of days ago, and they went to see the other grandparents up in Illinois. And while they were here, we spent some time playing with my 50-plus-year-old Hot Wheels. Now, I played with these cars so much as a child, they didn't have much value, uh, but they definitely don't now. Well, this week we're starting a new unit. It's called Elijah, Living Outside the Comfort Zone. The first lesson is entitled, Serve with Courage out of 1 Kings 16 and 17, so go ahead and be finding that. The point of this lesson is that serving God often calls for courage. Well, we all have our comfort zones, don't we? There are things we like to do and other tasks that we don't care for. Comfort zones are appealing because, well, they're, they're so comfortable, right? But we, we grow by being stretched outside of our comfort zones. And you and I know that it, it's usually not pleasant when that happens. When we're doing something outside our comfort zone, we get nervous, our blood pressure increases. But after we do that for a while, a few times, we usually realize it wasn't really as bad as we thought and made it out to be. It's quite similar to exercise. If you're not used to exercising, then the uh, least bit of physical exertion is going to raise your heart rate. It's going to exhaust you quickly because your comfort zone is to be on the couch with a bucket of chicken in your hand. But the more you exercise, your body gets used to it, build up some stamina, and you're able to do even more physical activity with less, ex less exhaustion. Well, for the next six Sundays, we're going to be looking at different scenes in the life of Elijah, taken mostly out of 1 Kings 16 through 19. We're going to study how Elijah lived outside of his comfort zone. Now, there's not a lot of background on Elijah. His name literally means, my God is Yahweh. Eli means my God. You'll remember that when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when you see the J-A-H suffix on a word in the Bible, it usually means Yahweh, like hallelujah, means praise the Lord or praise Yahweh. Elijah just appears on the biblical scene in 1 Kings 17.1, which is part of our lesson text this week, but our lesson begins in 1 Kings 16, verse 29 through 33. So before we dive into that, let's get a little historical background. Upon the death of Solomon in 931 BC, the United Kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. You had Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Now Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, became king of Judah, while Jeroboam became the first king of Israel. Now Omri was the sixth king of Israel. And like the five before him, going all the way back up to Jeroboam, he was an evil king. Ahab, Omri's son, became king around 685 BC, which, which was in the 38th year of Judah's king Asa's reign. Now, Asa was a good king in Judah. And while Ahab, though, he, he not only followed in his father's footsteps of being evil, but as verse 30 tells us, he was more evil than all of his predecessors. In fact, he uh, considered the sins of Jeroboam trivial. Well, let's stop right there for a moment. You know, there's this saying that what one generation tolerates, the next generation embraces. And, and then when you get a few generations down, down the line, things considered egregious by, by those a few decades ago, um, they're now laughable, if not embraced. And I believe we can see that with so many issues in our society today. And that was the case here, that the sins of Jeroboam were thought of as nothing by Ahab. And to make matters worse, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal. And his name literally meant Baal is with him, or with him is Baal. And he was the king of the, the Sidonians. Now, you might recall that the area of Sidon, where the Sidonians, were, they, they were, it was mentioned in the Bible several times, usually paired with Tyre. Like Jesus said in Luke 10, 13, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida, for the miracles that were performed in you, if they'd been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. See, this was an area, Sidon was an area where uh, when the children of Israel were going in and conquering the promised land, they didn't overthrow Sidon in their conquest. And so Sidon's idolatry, pagan practice continued, even leading Israel to copy its sins, partially due here to Mr. Ahab. 
and, and then, get back to Ahab, not only did he have uh, a pagan woman as a bride, a definite no-no for Israelites, he, he then proceeded to serve and worship Baal. And then Ahab made an Asherah pole. Now, Asherah was the fertility goddess of the Canaanites, and sometimes this pole was, was a representation of the goddess, and other times it was, was carved in the shape of a phallic symbol. You, you see, our society isn't the first sexually saturated culture. So it, it's no wonder at the end of verse 33 that it says that Ahab did more to anger God than all the kings before him. He was the worst of the worst. Now, we're going to skip over to chapter 1. I'm sorry, we're going to skip over to chapter 17, verse 1 of 1 Kings. And this is where we're first introduced to Elijah. Now, let's look at the first phrase that he spoke to the king. He, he said, As the Lord God of Israel lives, in whose presence I stand. Now, I've mentioned this many times before, but as a reminder, when you see L-O-R-D in all capital letters in the Old Testament, that's the, the Yahweh. That's the covenant name of God. So just saying that phrase to the king took courage. Remember that Elijah literally meant, my God is Yahweh. And he's speaking to a Baal worshiper. And uh, Elijah is, is taking an oath that as Yahweh lives, there will be no dew or rain during the upcoming years, except by his, by Elijah's command, God through him, of course. Yes, that's bold, but here's what makes the story even better. According to the Canaanite religion, Baal was the controller of rain. So there wasn't going to be any rain for years until the true God who controlled rain said so. He's going to say that through the prophet Elijah. Well, you've heard the, the saying, don't kill the messenger. Well, that was not the thought that was going through the minds of Ahab and Jezebel. And we're going to examine more about them and their chase of uh, Elijah in the upcoming weeks. But God knew their thoughts. And because of that, as we look in verses 2 through 6 of 1 Kings um, 17, we see that God told Elijah to leave and hide in a particular wadi. Now, you know what a wadi is? It's a valley or it's a ravine that was that's dry, except in the rainy season. You know, you could call it an intermittent, intermittent seasonal stream. But how was he going to eat? He couldn't chance somebody bringing him food uh, for fear that he would be found out. But, but God, of course, provided a miraculous situation. God would command ravens to bring him food. The bread and the meat uh, that Elijah is fed while, while hiding was reminiscent of God providing quail and manna to the children of Israel as they traveled through the desert. You see, God's not only the creator of nature, he controls it as well. He can withhold rain, send manna from heaven, instruct birds to feed his prophet Elijah, as well as keep hungry lions in their den from devouring the prophet Daniel. I read a statement in a commentary today, and it said this, Should we avoid taking these stories seriously? Should we treat them like a McDonald's Happy Meal, only cherishing them as, as children but not as an adult? Of course not. If you, if you strip away the stories of the Bible and try to hold on to the faith, you have a building with no foundation. Now, what I find most interesting about this story is that God used an unclean animal, a raven, to feed his prophet. Now, again, God's in control of nature. He can use whatever he wants to, whomever he wants to, to accomplish his pur purpose. He can use a Gentile nation to punish a disobedient Israel. He can use the story of a marriage of Hosea to his adulterous wife, Gomer, to illustrate how much God loves his people, even when they're unfaithful to him. So if someone brings it up in class that an unclean animal was used to, to bring food to Elijah, let's remind them that, that the birds were under the command of God, and Elijah wasn't eating the ravens anyway, all right? So, so this is our first lesson in the unit on Elijah. So what can we take away from this? How will this lesson help us, not just Sunday morning, but Monday morning when we go to work? How is it going to help us? Well, let's first encourage our class to obey God, whatever he's instructing us to do. Now, this could be something as straightforward as following a command to do something or not to do something that's written in the Bible. It's there in black and white. Or it could be something that God's impressed on your, your heart to do. Maybe teach a class or talk to a co-worker or, 
or invite someone to church, you know, just to name a few things. And even though it could be something very simple, sometimes it might be something that takes a lot of courage. And that's another lesson that, that we can learn here from Elijah. And that is to, to be courageous, to stand up for what is right, even if it's costly. Now, we also need to pray that we can be discerning so we aren't allowing false beliefs and false practices into our lives, into our classes, into our churches. Well, next week we're going to be looking, we're going to be seeing that the, the drought, when the drought came, the wadi dried up. What's he going to do? How's he going to get anything to drink? Well, we're going to see that God tells him to go to Sidon. Now, remember, that's the place where Jezebel's from. We're going to see that Elijah had to trust God in that. So, don't forget to pray for with your class this week. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate you.